So next up we have um, Dr. Julia Mason, and she's going to talk about the broken train of, chain of trust. Thank the broken you. chain of trust. So hi, I'm Julia Mason, and I'm a pediatrician who doesn't usually give talks. So <laughs> please <laughs> be forgiving. Also, I'm looking at mine. I can't see if I've changed the slides. Somebody like wave when I change the slide. Okay, I'm on the I'm I'm on the board. I'm a founding board member of the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, SEGM. I completed my pediatric training at Children's Hospital Los Angeles in 1997. SEGM is an international group of doctors, researchers, and academics. It's changed, right? <laughs> we came together in 2019. It hasn't changed. Does that change it? Does that change it? Does, which one of these buttons? Or I could just do this and somebody else could change it. Oh my God. Well, you know, it's here. I could change it. Yeah, OK. All right. So I'll follow you. OK. Come on this one, yeah. Yay. In 2019, in response to what looked like the ideological capture of our medical societies and academic leadership, we're concerned that currently the response, the medical response to a gender dysphoric child in many places is life-altering medicalization with puberty blockers, hormones, and surgeries. We're working primarily in the academic sphere, but given the difficulties we've had getting published, we're also working to share information directly with physicians and the public. There's a well-recognized lack of solid medical research on how best to care for children with gender dysphoria. No one has conducted a controlled clinical trial. All we have is low-quality evidence that normally would not be appropriate for guiding medical decision-making, especially when the interventions are irreversible and carry a heavy medical burden. But for some reason, in this area of gen pediatric medicine, not only is poor evidence allowed, it's heavily promoted by major medical organizations. So I want to talk to you about the broken chain of trust in medicine. When you study medicine, it quickly becomes obvious that the amount of information needed to successfully treat patients is massive. It's beyond comprehension. No one person can grasp it all. So you have to trust that someone has done the research. A group of thoughtful, rational people have taken the time to determine what is the best course of action. As a student, you don't have time to read the original papers that back up the treatment plan you're being taught. Dr. Stephen Levine talked about this concept in his conversation with Stella and Sasha in their podcast. He said before he started medical school, he went to a pre-medical conference and a professor held up a massive book and he said, this is the textbook of medicine. 90% of it is wrong, but I can't tell you which 10% will still be the truth in 20 years. Someone told me that too in the beginning of medicine. Facts and understanding are changeable events. Dr. Levine then described young doctors and psychologists confidently telling him exactly how gender dysphoria is to be treated. They were confident because this is what they were taught in medical school or grad school. They were operating based on 100% trust in what they had been told. So I had the good fortune to start medical school on an MSTP fellowship, and that stands for Medical Scientist Training Program. My plan was to get an MD and a PhD in nutrition and then teach nutrition to medical students, and that um, didn't happen, which is a whole other story. But I did get to look at medicine a little, difficult, a little differently due to having breaks in my medical education during which I was being a graduate student instead of a medical student. I spent time in the part of the system that generates the data and eventually the treatment plans. I wasn't just force-fed a thousand plans and told to memorize them. So if you are trying to decide whether a treatment plan is supported by evidence, you need to evaluate the evidence. And this is the thing that working pediatricians, for example, don't have the time or the inclination to do. The lowest level of evidence. The lowest quality of evidence is expert opinion. Now, this is still what controls a lot of what happens in medicine. 
but it's eminence-based, not evidence-based. The middle levels consist of case series and reports, then case controlled studies, then cohort studies, then randomized controlled trials. The highest quality evidence is derived from systematic reviews of the evidence and meta-analyses. In the case of gender, systematic reviews of the evidence have been performed by NICE in the United Kingdom and by the national health authorities in Finland and Sweden. As I think you already know, all of these countries subsequently put a halt to immediate affirmative care for minors after doing a systematic review of the evidence because each of these reviews found that the evidence supporting pediatric, pe pediatric gender transition is just not there. And yet, every major medical organization in the United States will swear up and down in a court of law that the science on this is settled. And the vast membership of the American Academy of Pediatrics, my professional organization, has been shielded from my dangerous opinions and requests. None of us have the brain power to truly deeply understand why what we do with our patients works. Medicine is littered with the detritus of treatments that we thought were appropriate, like bed rest for back pain or diet changes for ulcers. Here's an amusing example from my field, pediatrics. Decades ago, scientists noted that entire intact proteins from mom's milk could be found in the blood of their babies. And they thought, wow, babies must have really leaky guts. Maybe that's how allergies develop. So the thought was, baby eats a food, protein from the food gets into the blood, they mount an immune response to this, voila, allergy. It was a decent thought, you know. So, so for almost all of my career, the advice about feeding babies has been nothing but breast milk until they're six months, and then you start with rice cereal, because who's allergic to rice? And then you add in more foods slowly, but you don't give milk until they're one, cow's milk, you don't give eggs until they're one, and you don't give peanuts until they're two. Then a British allergist went to Israel and noticed that they have a snack there, which is basically peanut butter puffs. It's like Cheetos, but with peanut butter. It is, it is delicious, and it's called bamba. People give it to babies routinely, and as it happens, peanut allergies are far less common in Israel than in the United Kingdom. So he arranged for a big case of Bamba to be shipped to London, and he recruited babies <laughs> that were younger siblings of his patients and thus were considered to be at high risk for developing food allergy, and he divided them into two matching groups. And one got the usual advice about feeding babies, and the other group were told, we want you to give your baby three grams of peanut every, three times a week, and this is how many puffs they need to eat, and here's a bunch of puffs. And the babies deliberately given peanut had a lower rate of peanut allergy. It wasn't zero, but it was less. And that blew up all the rules about feeding babies. I have very few rules now about feeding babies. <laughs> so how does this apply to pediatric gender medicine? Well, the basis for the practice was laid out in what we often call the Dutch studies. And in 2014, Dutch clinicians published a paper on their new method for treating gender dysphoria in young people in which adolescents were medically transitioned to appear as the opposite sex. Their published group was comprised of the first 70 completers, and then you might start thinking about some bias there, but it gets worse, of which outcomes were reported for the first 55 that basically survived to the end. And for some measures, they reported on as few as 32, such as for the two-point scale decrease from minimally depressed to minimally depressed. Their measurement of gender dysphoria with a sex-specific questionnaire was completed by 33 people. And then, as you've already heard, they flipped the scale at the end of the study, and they started asking the natal males about their periods and the natal females about their erections. And I've always said I could take a gender dysphoric kid give them a fetching hat, and tell them that it totally makes them look like the opposite sex, and then administer the opposite sex Utrecht gender dysphoria scale, and I would get significant results. <laughs> the 15 non-completers included three people who developed morbidity, which prevented them from continuing, two people who refused to take part, one person who medically detransitioned, and one person who died from post-surgical sepsis as a direct result of their transition. And keep in mind that these cases were excluded from consideration 
when the Dutch reported their modest improvements in this uncontrolled and unscientific study of major medical interventions. To this day, the Dutch study represents the strongest <laughs> clinical evidence for the supposed benefits of adolescent medical transition. More recently, we've been told that puberty blockers prevent suicide in young people with gender dysphoria. The paper promoting this idea is based on a poor quality convenience sample survey, a mostly online survey that offered cash prizes for participation. <laughs> this was a political survey created by the National Center for Transgender Equality. It was not designed for medical research. It was a lobbying, a lobbying document. Participants were recruited through transgender advocacy organizations or social media and were asked to promote the survey among their friends. This recruiting method yielded a large but highly biased sample. The experiences of detransitioners were not included. Transitioned people who were not politically active were also underrepresented in the, in the survey. There's good evidence that the 2015 USTS is not representative of the US population who identify as transgender. The quality of the data is also highly suspect. For example, 73% of the respondents who reported taking puberty blockers said they started them after age 18, which seems unlikely, as most young people have finished puberty by that age. Finally, this data set, this snapshot in time, makes it impossible to determine causation between linked factors. We can't decide if puberty blockers prevent suicide from this study. Despite this, the idea that puberty blockers save lives has become the dominant narrative in both the popular press and medical journals. Multiple rebuttals to this paper were submitted pointing out flaws, but the journal, which is the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, refused to correct the paper or even acknowledge the letters by publishing them. This is the usual process in science when there's open debate. The same survey has been used by young Jack Turbin for at least six other papers on topics ranging from trying to prove that psychotherapy is harmful to asserting that surgery is extremely helpful. None of the rebuttals to any of these papers have been published by these journals. Stifling debate breaks the chain of trust. Busy doctors don't have time to evaluate the quality of the research. We trust the journals to vet the research they are publishing and to platform debate. For me, the final straw was when this paper in the journal Pediatrics was selected as their number one paper of the year. 2020. I wrote to Dr. Lewis first, the editor, and his first response was that this paper was selected because it got the most clicks. <laughs> and then he told me <laughs> that I should submit a pediatrics perspective sharing my concerns. Let me tell you what happened when I followed his advice. I wrote a paper called Far From Settled Science, a call for caution in the care for gender dysphoric youth, based on my experience with multiple transitioning teenagers none of whom were thriving. It was a frontline report, something that pediatrics has a tradition of publishing under the category of pediatrics perspectives. I expressed concern about what's happening with pediatric medical transition and talked about the lack of evidence supporting it. Per the usual process, it was sent out for peer review. I expected pushback, but I didn't expect what I got. I had all these points about what worried me, and then I referenced the developmental issue of socially transitioning young children by saying, Children are likely to believe that the doctors can actually change their sex when they grow up. We can't, and it's cruel to imply that we can. The reviewers had a big issue with this statement. Apparently, the first reviewer thinks that we do change the sex of our patients, <laughs> and the second one was worried that my assertion would offend children who read medical journals. <laughs> I maintain that we, can, that we can only achieve a shallow cosmetic approximation of the opposite sex with drugs and surgery, and that the journal Pediatrics is for pediatricians, adults who have completed college, medical school, and residency. Needless to say, my paper was not accepted for publication. It's not just my paper getting binned. Researchers have submitted 
dozens of papers and rebuttals without success. The top tier journals who promote these notions are unwilling to publish our rebuttals. Of course, we have had success getting our rebuttals into other high quality journals, but unfortunately, they're not widely read by pediatricians. I do recommend taking a look at these articles, for which I'm a co author Reconsidering Informed Consent for Trans Identified Children, Adolescents, and Young Adults was sent out to multiple reviewers, of course. After it was published, the same journal published four commentaries, two relatively friendly, one snide, and one fairly hostile, which is great. This is how science is supposed to advance, with open debate. We responded to three of the commentaries in the pithily titled, What Are We Doing to These Children? The commentary of DeVries, who is the lead author on the original Dutch studies I referenced earlier, merited a full paper in response. So the myth of reliable research in pediatric gender medicine, a critical evaluation of the Dutch studies and research that has followed, that paper is essentially the longer version of this brief presentation and is freely available on the web. So highly recommended, check that out. Um, last year, this paper came out by Tordoff et al. Jesse Single summarizes the situation in his headline. Researchers found puberty blockers and hormones didn't improve trans kids' mental health at their clinic. Then they published a study claiming the opposite. This paper is amazing. Amazing that it got published. <laughs> when it came out, I Googled all the authors, trying to figure out who was in charge so I would know who to complain to. But none of them are established researchers. That, to me, is telling. I can't, take, I can't take the time to really tear this paper apart. We break it down in the myth of reliable research, and Jesse's Substack post really goes into detail about it. But basically, they followed a few dozen patients through their experiences with their gender clinic and found that the patients getting affirmative care didn't have significantly improved mental health scores. But hey, the untreated kids got worse, at least the ones that stuck around. So if you squint and run some fancy statistics, you can posit that the treated kids would have also gotten worse, so the fact they stayed pretty much the same is actually an improvement. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's, that's what it says. This not, it's not how this paper was presented to the public. This was the press release. Gender-affirming care dramatically reduces depression for transgender teens, study finds. The first sentence reads, UW Medicine researchers recently found that gender-affirming care for transgender and non-binary adolescents caused rates of depression to plummet. And that's pretty much how things go in the super special world of pediatric gender medicine. Null results get magic into positive results, and everybody knows that affirmative care saves lives. Here's another example of what happens in gender world. Asha et al. published a paper on chest masculinization mastectomy on 14 to 24 year olds, but had only a three month follow up and a 14% dropout rate. Their conclusion, as you can see, is that top surgery is associated with improved chest dysphoria, gender congruence, and body image satisfaction in this age group. Conspicuously missing from the list of significant results are things like rates of depression, anxiety, life satisfaction, or other useful psychological measures. The chest dysphoria scale is a lot like the Utrecht gender dysphoria scale. If you remove someone's breasts at their request, the score is going to improve. Nevertheless, in this paper, they claimed that their findings would, quote, help dispel misconceptions that gender-affirming treatment is experimental, close quote. The paper was accompanied by an editorial, this is JAMA Pediatrics, entitled, Top Surgery in Adolescents and Young Adults, Effective and Medically Necessary. I could go on all night, but I'm trying to make this fit into 20 minutes. Okay, one more. <laughs> Chen et al. This is the big long-term project we've been waiting for because they got big bucks from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. They had to describe what they planned to do with the money. They said they would look at eight things, gender dysphoria, depression, anxiety, trauma symptoms, self-injury, suicidality, body esteem, and quality of life. In this paper, they report on depression and anxiety, and they don't have awesome results, and they don't report on the other six. They, of course, had a massive dropout rate of 30% in just two years, 
and two out of 315 patients died from suicide, which is a stunningly high rate. These are kids being affirmed at what's supposed to be the best gender clinics in the country. They also did some statistical shenanigans. In this case, Windsorizing the data. This is a thing where you throw out the very top and bottom of the data set. And it's reasonable if you're dealing with data like income or house prices, but it's totally inappropriate for bounded psychological results. So we need to be following the evidence, not self-declared experts. We are engaging in a massive, uncontrolled medical experiment on children. You know, it's not even an experiment because most clinics aren't collecting any sort of follow-up data. We don't know how, what, we don't know why so many young people are identifying as trans and we know even less about how best to care for these children. The chain of trust has been broken in the field of pediatric gender transition. Everybody knows that gender-affirming care is life-saving a care, except that nobody has actually shown this to be true. SEGM is one of a few organizations fighting for transparency in gender medicine and restore the integrity of the scientific process in the field of gender medicine. Unfortunately, our well-reasoned attempts are frequently met with accusations of transphobia. Every week, more and more clinicians reach out to us and our ranks are growing. This year, we're working on several projects that we think will be highly impactful. Um, I wanna encourage you to check out our website and get in contact with us if you want more detailed information. Thank you.